So the next part of our lecture here, we're going to talk a little bit more about the rock cycle, introduce you to this again. And then we'll talk about those three different classes of rocks. Now, do you remember what the definition of a rock is? What are the three parts of that definition? It's natural, it's solid, it's aggregates, so combined pieces of minerals or sometimes non-minerals. The three classes of rocks are igneous, formed from melt, sedimentary, formed from pieces of other rocks, otherwise known as sediments, and metamorphic, other rocks that have been altered by heat and pressure, but not melted. The fact that I've repeated these definitions so often makes you think you should probably know them for the exam. Any exams that come up, you're gonna to wanna to know these. So once again, we have igneous rocks formed from melt. You can see the molten rock right over here. Since it's at Earth's surface on this volcano, that's called lava. Sedimentary rock, sediments here are in the process of forming. Um, they're being transported down this river, deposited here. They're not a rock yet because they're not one big solid piece yet. It's a pile of sand, basically. But if you bury this delta and you lithify the sediments, now you've got a sandstone. That's a rock. And metamorphic. So we can see that this rock has probably been squished in some direction somehow. It's likely that we had some heat that was applied to this rock as well, for reasons we'll talk about. But as long as it was never melted, this is metamorphic. And within each class of rocks, remember that we talked about the two variables that we can classify them based on texture, the size and arrangement and shape of the grains that make each of these rocks up, and composition, the minerals that make them up, or the elemental identities of the atoms that make it up, the elements that the rocks are made of. We'll focus on each of these for the first few weeks, because we want to know what the texture and composition terms are going to be for igneous rocks. There are certain terms that we use for igneous rocks only, certain terms that we use for sedimentary rocks only, and there are certain terms that we use for metamorphic rocks. And that's because the texture and the composition, the reason that we classify them that way, as we'll see, is because these variables give us clues as to the, how each type of rock formed. And if we're reading these rocks, the reason we care about any of these rocks at all, is because we can look at those rocks and learn something about what Earth was like when these rocks were being formed. So the very basic process for igneous rocks is that you take whatever other rocks you started with, you bury them probably because burial increases the amount of heat that they are subjected to. Underground, it gets hotter pretty fast, about uh, 25 degrees every kilometer that you go down. So as you bury these rocks deeper and deeper, they'll get hotter and hotter until they melt. Or sometimes you can just melt rocks by intruding more magma next to them and sort of uh, you know, baking them that way. At any rate, you take those rocks and you melt them. And then as you cool melted material, as you cool a liquid, we know from experience with water that if you cool water, that it solidifies, crystallizes and becomes ice. You take molten former rock material and you cool it down, it's going to solidify, it's going to crystallize and it's going to form what we call igneous rocks. Let's, uh, let's branch that out a little bit and just make it a little more complicated. If you bury it and you melt it, we said we have this molten material, we call that magma. Magma if it's underground. If you erupt that magma to the surface, like in a volcano, we call it lava above ground. Is either of these a mineral? No, because it's not solid. Is either of these a rock? No, again, because it's not solid yet. But if you cool that magma 
And if it's underground, because it's insulated there um, underground and it's around a bunch of hot stuff anyway, it's going to cool much more slowly and solidified. We get something called intrusive igneous rock, it forms inside Earth. How do we know it was inside? Well, we were calling it magma, right? So that must be stuff that's underground. In contrast, if you cool lava above ground and it cools very fast, it's out there, you know, in, in everyday temperatures, rocks tend to be solid. And so if you erupt something onto the relatively cold surface, this lava is gonna cool pretty fast. Once it solidifies, we call it extrusive igneous rocks, forms external to earth. Any way that we can remember, right, these, these terms I'm, I'm almost certain you haven't seen before. You're going to have to remember a lot of these terms. So any mnemonic that you can use is going to help to keep some of these straight. So intrusive forms inside Earth. Intrusive inside. Extrusive forms external to Earth on Earth's exterior. Right, if you intrude into something, you push your way inside. Extrusive, if you extrude something, you push it out. So this is external to Earth. Remember that any way you can, but intrusive rocks form inside and extrusive outside. And you'll notice that I've patterned these slightly differently. This has sort of one solid color to it, and this has a pattern of individually visible squares. That's just because I want you to start to associate intrusive rocks with crystals that we can see, individual ones, and extrusive rocks, the crystals are so small we can't see it. So we start to see that there is a texture component that we can learn something about the rock purely by looking at those variables we were talking about. That texture, um, whether it is, and we'll, we'll talk about these terms, whether it's affinitic or phanaritic, whether you can't see the greens or you can see the greens, if it's an igneous rock, it tells you where it formed. So it can already tell you something about the history of that rock just by looking at that texture. Okay, so intrusive versus extrusive. Let's repeat. Intrusive rocks, they cool slow. They cool underground. So they cool slow because they're around a bunch of other hot stuff. If you never take your pie out of the oven where it's hot, it's going to cool much more slowly than it is if you take your pie out and you put it on the counter. Because it cools slowly, because the process cooling underground is so slow, there is time for them to grow big crystals. And so you see these big crystals in a rock like granite, which is intrusive. They're big enough to see, it must have been extru extrusive. We can call that coarse grained, is our sort of colloquial way to call it, because the grains are coarse, the grains are fairly large. The more technical term that you'll see is phanaritic. And the reason that we can interpret the rock, an igneous rock, as forming underground is because we can look at the texture, the phanaritic texture, and we know something then, we can interpret something based on the physical processes that have formed this rock because we know the rate must have been slow, right? We look at this rock and we say, okay, it must have had time to grow big crystals, which means that it must have cooled slowly, which means that it probably was cooling underground. That's how we go from an observational term, like phanaritic, looking at the texture, and how we interpret it, which is how it formed. Just an example of that. Be on the lookout for more things like that because it's key to understand what we observe and then what we interpret based on those observations. We can't look at a rock and say, oh, this rock cooled underground without doing these steps in between and knowing how those steps work. So intrusive, inside Earth. Extrusive, exterior to Earth. Cools fast, Earth's exterior. Because it's cooling so fast, it has less time to grow crystals, and you end up with very small crystals. Fine-grained, also known as an affinitic texture. That's an A. 
aphanitic, aphanitic, without crystals. You can maybe see a couple of tiny little crystals in here, right? That one there, that one there. But for the most part, you're only going to see crystals in here if you zoom in with a microscope and look at it really closely. Rhyolite is extrusive. It turns out these rocks have the same composition. It's the same stuff that makes it up. The only difference is their texture. We'll see granite and rhyolite again. Let's go over this real briefly one more time. So we take this silicate-based liquid, silicate being the, the types of materials that make up the stuff, and we cool it slowly. The crystals thus have time to grow, proceeding forward in time. We can look at how these crystals are growing. They're grabbing atoms from this liquid melt. And over time, once they hit each other, they can't grow anymore over there, but they'll still keep growing in this direction. So we see that crystal stops growing there and we have a grain boundary there, but it keeps growing out until you cool it all the way. None of the liquid is remaining and everything is a solid. And you end up with a network of intergrown crystals, giving it a crystalline texture. All the magma has been used up. If it cooled slowly, then you can see all those crystals for the most part. And you end up with an intrusive rock with a phaneritic texture. Intrusive describes the process that formed it. Phaneritic describes the variable that you're looking at, the observation, in this case, the texture. What would happen in an extrusive rock? Well, going from step one to two, you're cooling it so fast that you'll have tons and tons of tiny little crystals in here. Each of those crystals is competing for the same molten material. And so none of them are going to grow very large. And you're going to end up with a network of intergrown crystals, but they're all going to be really, really tiny. You end up with an extrusive rock, with an aphanetic texture. Uh, before we go on here, let me just, I'm not going to do this every time, but let's write down some of the vocab words, or at least highlight them here, because I've already written them here that you should have written down in your notes somewhere. Intrusive, phaneritic, extrusive, aphanitic. These are all igneous rocks. These are vocab words that you are going to need to know. So somewhere you should have these definitions written down, at least in your own words. Moving on to sedimentary rocks. They form by very different processes. They form from sediments. They form at Earth's surface, and they don't involve molten rock. So we take whatever other rocks we started with, could be igneous, could be metamorphic, could be older sedimentary rocks, and we weather them. We break them down. We erode them. We move the pieces away to a new location. In between, there are some other steps. We transport. We deposit, put them down somewhere. Then we lithify them. We start to stick together. We might bury them to put some a little bit of extra pressure on them. We might that will compact them because we're squishing all the water out. And we're squishing the sediments together. And we might even grow new minerals in between in a process called cementation. That makes sedimentary rock. In this case, we call it a clastic sedimentary rock because it's made of class individual solid pieces that break down. We'll get into that later. If we break down rocks, we weather them into sediment. So these are individual solid pieces or solid grains. We call it sediment. And we call the rock that they're made of clastic sedimentary rock. If instead we take that and we dissolve some chemicals, so much like salt totally disappears if you put it in water because the ions that make it up are dissolving. They're separating completely from one another in that solution. If you were to precipitate them out again, you leave that glass of salt water out overnight and the water evaporates, you're going to regrow some of those salt crystals. That's called a chemical sedimentary rock. This one was formed by pieces. This one was formed from dissolved chemicals originally. So here's a new vocab word for you to at least start to, to recognize. 
And then if you haven't seen these terms before, those are terms to start to, to recognize as well. We'll see them and we'll define them in a little more detail once we get to the lecture fully on sedimentary rocks. But it's good to, to see each of these multiple times because it really takes multiple passes to learn any of these things. So clastic sedimentary rocks. Sediments come from other rocks. They are class, pieces of older rocks. Something like a conglomerate we can see pretty clearly is made of chunks of older rocks. Looks like pebbles that are stuck together. Some of them have been rounded like this one and this one. Some of them are a little more angular maybe like this one here. And we know that these things are become rounded because like if, if you ever find stream rocks, they tend to be rounded. Those things get rounded by, by mechanical action and, and dissolution in streams. This isn't the same as one of those crystalline rocks because it looks like some pieces are rounded. None of the grains really contact one another or if they do, they're very rare contacts, these clasts in here. And there's this matrix, this other stuff is what connects all of them. So looking at this as a geologist with a little more experience, I can tell that this is sedimentary and not igneous because it doesn't have that crystalline texture that we noticed before. And it looks like this one's made of other pieces of older rocks, these clasts. So I know that it's a clastic sedimentary rock. In contrast, chemical sedimentary rock, these sediments come from dissolved chemicals. This is what a rock might look like that crystallizes if you were to evaporate uh, a salty lake, like Great Salt Lake, or even if you were to evaporate an entire ocean basin, you'd get a lot of stuff that's called evaporite, which is a chemical sedimentary rock formed from evaporation. This, these crystal faces in here are faces of the mineral halite, which is also known as table salt. So this rock probably was actually formed in Earth's past, by evaporation of salty water over time. So I'm going to try here to show a video time lapse of what the precipitation process looks like, because you're probably not super familiar with the chemical process of precipitation. But when I say that, I want you to imagine something happening like this. And in this video, you're going to see salt water in this dish and it's being allowed to evaporate over time. So those dissolved ions, which you can't see because they're super submicroscopic, but as they start to combine into these structures, you'll see they're organizing themselves into orderly crystal shapes. Let's give this a try. So as you saw those, that video go on, you saw those crystals grow larger and larger in the precipitation process as the ions, the dissolved ions in the water start to combine into new mineral structures. The last class of rock to talk about is the metamorphic rocks. Take any other rocks and you subject them to deep burial. Got to be de deep enough that you get a lot of heat and a lot of pressure being put on some of those rocks. And you start to change the minerals in there because the, the atoms that make up those minerals are going to reorient themselves into structures that that heat and pressure favors. Pressure being put on rocks is going to push the, the atoms into a more compact structure and heat's going to do some complicated things that we'll eventually talk about. As long as we recrystallize things without ever melting them, we get what's called metamorphic rock. The metamorphic grade refers to just how much those rocks have been altered by heat and pressure. So shale is actually the parent sedimentary rock of these. And this arrow represents more heat 
more pressure being put on these rocks, maybe as you bury them deeper and deeper. Shale turns into slate, which looks very similar to shale. It ends up being much harder. Um, and then it becomes phyllite. And it's when it's phyllite, it tends to take on a slightly wavy texture to it. You can see some of the, the bumps in the surface there a little bit. Um, the color starts to change a little bit, reflecting the fact that these minerals are changing. And it often starts to look a little waxy because the crystals in this start to grow a little bit larger. And our eye can't quite see the crystals yet, but it does see the, the light reflecting off of them in a certain way and gives it sort of a waxy sheen to it. As we put more heat and pressure on it, we form schist and we can start to see some of those mineral crystal grains and they sparkle because of the identity of those crystals. And then the furthest we go is nice, spelled G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, like we're crazy. So when I say the word nice to describe a rock, it's got a silent G. Um, this is the highest grade, the most heat and pressure that it's been put on these rocks. They've never melted up to this point. They've just reorganized the atoms that are in there. That's the process of metamorphism in a nutshell. So to see if you remember what we talked about here and how much you paid attention, without going back and looking, I'd like you to try diagramming the rock cycle. I want you to use three boxes, those igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. You don't need the subclasses of rocks. You don't need to put the magma in the lava or the sediments. So you just need these three classes. And I want you to add the processes that change one type into another. Pause here, take a moment, try to do that for yourself. That's the way that you're gonna get the most out of this lecture and the most out of this course. So here's how I'd start. I just write my boxes, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. And then I'll draw the processes that change one into another. How do we make sedimentary rocks? Weathering to break them down, and erosion, and eventually we lithify them. Lithification is the process of turning sediments, combining the, the, the pieces into a new rock. Same process down here, weathering and lithification. How do we make metamorphic rocks? Well, we take any other rocks, we subject them to heat and pressure without melting. What about igneous rocks? We take other rock types and we melt them. And then we cool them off again. Now, I had said before, you know, it's really more like if we start to melt them, we're going to go this way, sedimentary rocks. But I mean, for our purposes, you can write that in because sedimentary will go to igneous eventually. So we want to have that process noted here. And if we wanted, we could even be a real stickler and say, we could turn igneous rocks into others as well. And we could do the same thing with each of these. The diagram might look complicated, but really it's just three types of rocks. Each one can turn into any of the other ones. And there's only one overall process that does it for any type of rock. Sedimentary rocks come from weathering and lithification. Igneous rocks from melting and recooling. Metamorphic rocks from heat and pressure, no melting. Here's that diagram written out in a, um, a much more readable way for you if you'd like to look at that to study from. Now let's briefly summarize the past two overall lectures. The first lecture, we talked about how Earth is a system of interconnected parts, these interacting subsystems. The time scales in those systems vary widely. Some things happen very slowly on the scale of millions or billions of years. Some things happen very quickly, seconds or faster. The principle of uniformitarianism, that is the present is the key to the past, lets us use the present and the processes happening, those physical processes that we talked about, to interpret the geologic record by understanding the same things that are making rocks today made rocks in the past. Process of science consists of testable ideas on different scale, the most basic ones being those hypotheses. We can always revise or change even the most entrenched ideas in science if we come up with new evidence that refutes those ideas. Talked a little bit about Earth's interior. 
One is a way to visit how that describes geology as a science, but also to look at the subsystems they're in and the way in which layers in Earth's interior can be defined by composition or physical properties. We define it by composition. It's got the parts crust, mantle, and core. If we define it in terms of physical properties, it's the lithosphere, asthenosphere, the deeper mantle, the outer core, and then the inner core. If you don't remember those pieces, go back and revisit that video. This lecture, we learned about how rocks are made of minerals. We learned about their definitions, which you should know. And then we went through the whole rock cycle, and how igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks are connected by processes that change one rock type into another. Thanks for watching this system of lectures, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time.